So it ties, it ties back to that line on a simple diet of crude oil, no solids, therefore no night soil. Uh, I'm not sure about that on a simple diet of crude oil, how that fits in. Because if, if my concept is, is uh, what I, is correct that he's really referring to people, not machines. Yeah, uh, I think it's crazy. Then, then, uh, then how would it be a simple diet of crude oil? But no yeah. solid night soil, of course, re refers to uh, excrement. Yes, excrement. It's what people put on in in some societies. They put on their gardens. Well, he's referring to soylent green here. You know, he's referring to the dystopian. Um, imagery of that time I believe you know and uh, if you if you don't eat right and you don't you just have your sliced white bread and your can of beer a night and go back into the the um, you know the the fixed um, uh, rotator belt job you're gonna you're gonna kill yourself you're gonna have no heart your eyes are going to be like ice but you're going to be as angry as all get out well, I still really think that he's talking about the machines here because it, first of all, it makes everything else fit. The machines do run on crude oil. Uh, they run day and night, which is part of why they're so attractive to the capitalist owners. Yeah. And, yeah and just like that article you sent me, Rainy, during the week, yeah. you know, um, the, Rainy sent me an article, but just of which it was this woman talking about how it's now like a race that the the uh, the owner class is in a race to develop the robots to the point where they literally no longer need the the workers. The humans, yeah. Um, and this was, you know, this has sort of all been in progress since the development of machines. Yeah. And um, so I, I I think he's talking about the machines. The the no solids, therefore no night soil. I thought that was a really interesting observation. And I mean, I never really thought about it before I read that, yeah. but it's still a curious comment because you don't I'm have not to sure. I mean, maybe, maybe the comment is, maybe the point is that it's another advantage of robots over humans as workers mm -hmm. that you don't have to deal with yeah. human things like shit. Yeah. And, and every, every, all other, byproducts of being an organic living being it's easier well, okay. the next, the next uh, how, thing goes with that yeah but, but how does the how does the last line tie in with your theory well their blood may boil their blood is i guess whatever fuel or lubricants they're running with which are typically going to be quite hot while they're in operation uh their eyes are ice i guess meaning you're not expecting much empathy or sympathy from a machine. Yeah, I think it's it's true that it's robots because the uh, the next uh, or the synthesis of production more than robot, it's the synthesis of production and the um, the um, kind of that word is not coming back to my head of the um, of the um... well, anyway the thing that ruined the work, worker because be. then he says slide rules and spanners are all they need. To keep them at the required speed, they are indeed a patient breed produced from a synthetic seed. So he's talking about robots and physically. Uh, no, I think no, there's no, a double no. entendre there. He's insinuating that we run the risk with that of becoming robot-like. I think. I think. Yeah, I think that's what he's saying. Is that yeah. it's people? It's people who are turning into robots. I don't think he. Had, I don't think he would have any reason to talk about robots. Well, I do. Um, I mean, just not like, because not, not like the not like the rest of the the rest of the poem has uh, so far been about how the effect on on humans of this dehumanizing process. Yeah, so I think it's, and, I think so, it's, and so is this part. I, I, I yeah, so is this part right here. But I think it's about humans rather than about machines. About Why robots. does it have to be either or? Yeah, I think um, that's what I said. there's a double entendre there. That's a, referring well, to both. Well, yeah. hold, hold on, Rainy. I've asked Chris a question, so I'll oh, give him a chance to answer. Well, uh, it could be either or, but I think probably, uh, you know, going with what, you're, what you've been doing, which is really trying to understand what Francis is saying, I think most likely what he's talking about is the 
the effect of all this dehumanizing on humans, this, this uh, turning us, essentially turning us into robots, or at least a lot of, a lot of the people who were caught in factory jobs and things like that, where they just repetitive jobs. My feeling, yeah, well, that, well, I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, I, I mean, I completely agree with that, but I still think that stanza above is really talking about the machines themselves. The second stanza um, is a little ambiguous to me because uh, machines do not themselves use slide rules. Um, it's the human designers that use the slide rules. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, the patient breed, well, the patient breed produced from a synthetic seed, that can actually refer to both the machines and the people who design and run them. And the people who do those jobs. So job? it's a good point. It's a good point what you're, what you're saying there. And I think maybe you've got the uh, putting your finger on it is that he's, he's showing that there is so little distinction between people and machines. At this point, it can refer to these, these stanzas could refer to either. And there's almost a, uh, a conscious effort by those in charge to minimize that difference between machines and humans, to turn humans, to make humans behave more like machines and function more like machines. I mean, you see it today at like Amazon and all their you know, their delivery timers and their videotapes of everything and their automatic algorithms that evaluate employees based on did they make their time quotas on their deliveries and so forth. Ooh, yeah, I think you're right about that. Mm -hmm. Finally, my Rico came back together. <laughs> Sorry. At one o'clock, there's a thousand things on my mind. I'm sorry, so it takes me a while to get into it. But it was conveyor belt. Yep, conveyor belt. So the conveyor belt is a robot with humans doing the same task till they're insane. Um, so I think it sort of insinuates it's a, a dual thing here. Because remember, conveyor belts were the big thing in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, move on. The neon. Oh, oh, hang on. I think uh, Eugene's got something. Go ahead. I, I would just like to point out that, um, you know, tedious work has always been with us. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, if any of you have ever worked in the fields, Thank agricultural you. fields. Right. You'll have a, a row of some, something growing that's a half a mile long. And it is so tedious to, you know, hold that row. Although I would also say that it's quite a bit different if you are outside. Well, if you're the owner, if you're sort of the proprietor of that land, you're working your own land. It's a totally different experience than if you're a cog on a corporate farm, for example. No doubt. Your, no. your labor is, you're just functioning as an interchangeable cog. It, it, makes, it makes a world of difference in how, you, how that tedious experience uh, impacts you. Yep. That also goes back to uh, page two, which they with their teeth will have to hoe. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Oh, you're muted, sure. Rainy. <laughs> Will I go on with the next one? Yeah. And Neon's son keeps night turn day. This relates back to the beginning that I was saying about neon lights. Yeah. Yep. And Neon's son keeps night turn day for easy speak men to rake the hay and geared fornicators grind away and bud-breasted girls sing a rondelay. What's a speak man? I think probably probably ad, ad men, advertising men. Yeah, he's a con man or a. An well, ad I think yeah. I mean, it could be all the people who assist in the propaganda on behalf of the you know the 
people in charge, which can include, you know, journalists and so forth, certainly these days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Whoever are the spokespeople. I, lo I love this, uh, for easy speakman to rake the hay, the way he's, I mean, obviously the phrase raking the hay right then has nothing to do with actual right. hay and farming, but it does tie that whole farming thing in with this mechanistic thing. I think that's but really wait a minute, there's that phrase, right? When you bring home the, the paycheck, you're raking in the hay. Right. Right, so it's a double entendre there. Yeah, yeah. So, so who are the geared fornicators? They are with their machine. It's continuous. Bang! It's just, it's a. They are. The who, who's 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 they? The speakman. The ad man, the con man, big fist. But he says easy speakman and geared fornicators as if they're two different entities. Yeah. Uh, that sounds that sounds like machines. Yeah. I don't know if it means referring to something else, but it sounds like machines. Maybe he means to say we're being fucked by the machines. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Yes, I'd say there's a lot in there. <laughs> that might be a dodecahedron of meanings. <laughs> Oops, I just remembered I turned the record on. Sorry. For... <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're grown ups. They can do it. <laughs> so not a double meaning, but a dodecahedron of meaning. I like that. And uh, yeah, I, don't, I use Barber's words all the time. Um, and we're, we're both geologists, gemologists. We can use dodecahedron just the same <laughs> in any other, more often than others. And Bud Breasted Girl Sing Around Light, it's definitely about the ad man. Definitely. All uh, right. Yeah. We uh, are happy little Vegemites, as happy as can be. We all enjoy our Vegemite for breakfast, lunch, and tea. You know that's that's really interesting. That you, I mean, I'm glad you pointed that thing out about these uh, neon girls on top of buildings and so forth in these ad signs, because he's got several references to them, and I have to say I took it as a sort of commentary on um, sort of young. Um, what's the word? Na naive literal young women who were sort of willingly becoming willingly be becoming enablers for big fist in exchange for you know the usual perks and so forth and you're right yeah you're right and i'm right or well, i could be wrong but just that that what mimi joys came up for me coming from the same city but you're right it is all tied into advertising and the, and the use, use of uh, uh, beautiful young girls to sell things. Yeah. But, but he's also saying, I think, that there is a responsibility and a culpability right. on, a pal, on, on the part of all, of all of us who allow ourselves to be, become a part of that, yeah. which we all do just to one extent or another. Can't help it, yeah. Yeah. I just uh, bud breasted to me that means uh you know a, a girl at puberty yeah really where, young. where they're where the yeah. where the breast is just forming whereas in advertising usually the women are Jane Mansfield types well not them you know, though with, we also with, have Twiggy with, oh, hold on Rainy Ray, let, him, let him finish if you want right. yeah um Oh, so what, what year is this, Rainy? 62. 62. No, that was pre-Twiggy. Right. Um, Twiggy didn't come around till about 60, 66, 67. Right. And be, before then, the 50s women, you know, were, had massive memories. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Eugenia, it brings... To, to my mind, the image of um, when I've seen in uh, communist countries, the, the, young, the young people singing uh, the patriotic anthems and so forth. We've all you know, we've seen it for Nazi Germany. We've seen it in China and so forth and so on. Because they, they start them young. They get them young and, and conscript them into uh, propagating this propaganda for the for the regime's message true the, the 
the, the USSR's um, uh, girls are are more uh, you know more restrained in their in their uh, the size of their tits. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> let me let me make a note in my manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> moving uh, right along <laughs> yeah maybe, go, go ahead Brady. oh and in wet uh, yeah that's it girls sing around delay and in wet pavements fitful gleams telling of love's perennial streams lovers discussing hems and seams discern fulfillment of their dreams that that to me is the wedding dress and all of the that sort of thing, hems and seams and ah, yeah, I was wondering about that. And uh, you say again what you said last time about the the wetness of the pavement, what what that signifies? Well, to me, it can't, it, it's coming from when you come from a wet city, you're constantly gazing at the beauty or it's like the gasoline and the water when you're little and you first see that rainbow you're constantly looking at the shadow as more beautiful than than the real you know that the wet pavement and the reflection of all the lights of a night and the neons and so on and and their fitful gleams tell of love's perennial streams it's it's like there's always illusion there uh, to uh, seduce you into thinking everything's okay and us lovers can get married and 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 get on with our dreams regardless of how tough except the gleams are telling of love's perennial streams yeah i said that yeah but they're speaking to the reality not not the illusion uh-huh don't you think no well, what are love's perennial streams if not the reality? Yeah, that's the reality, but it gives you the illusion everything's going to be gorgeous. Yeah, the wet pavements like um, give me that image too, Rainy, of um, of beauty. Mm -hmm. You know where. Um, uh, you know those of us who have tripped on acid have you know see the beauty of in the ugliness of uh uh you know of an ugly you know cities are basically ugly yeah in a secondary image you can see beauty and uh but but i i would say that the beauty is real that what we're that that beauty that we're seeing is the reality within that ugliness and that illusion that's mm -hmm. fine with me I, we hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that old man Hope, oh boy. <laughs> then home, sweet home again at night, in car, bus, train, packed, sardine tight, for non-breakage and the delight of togetherness in the same plight. <laughs> so he is referring to um, a dream state and going in and out of dream states and then you come home of a night in in the packed train, uh, sardine tight, and um, and you bond with each other uh, in in love in your little flat, your little apartment, but you're in the same plight. Yep, that uh, mass exodus into the city to work and then yeah. come back home at night. Yeah. So. Um... There's an issue for me with this stanza. Uh, which sardines. Is, it's, <laughs> not, it's not the sardines per se. Oh. <laughs> um, I love sardines. The, um, I mean, the packed sardine tight for non-breakage is, is that's sort of speaking of the intent, again, of, of, the, uh, of the rulers. I don't know what to call them, the, the big fist that it's in big fists interest to you know protect the goods in this case the the worker or the working robots so he, he doesn't want them broken so he packs them tight just like yeah. you would eggs so they but don't break yeah 
So because then that, that like but it. yeah, but then the problem is, is that they're packed that way for non breakage, which is sort of the convenience of the owners. Although I don't suppose the people want to get broken either, mm -hmm. but they're also packed that way for the delight of of, of togetherness. Yeah, which because would, would not necessarily be something that the owners would necessarily be caring about. So they don't care. But, but you, you the see people that, care. The people you, feel a unity in their plight. They have a unity in their suffering. They have a unity in their sardine packedness. So this is sort of in spite of whatever the uh, the owner's intent was for them. Uh, this is sort of like a saving grace that, shall we say, God has provided um, that the that the togetherness yeah. is shared even in these uh, very difficult conditions. Yes, and they uh, un uh, they didn't see what was coming. <laughs> yeah, I, Chris. See, I see it differently. I, I think he's being sarcastic or ironic here. Pack sardine tight for non breakage and the delight of togetherness in the same plight. I don't think there's any particular delight that they, any real delight that they take from that. It's unpleasant being packed and squeezed together in a subway train or a, a bus or something like that. So I think he's just being ironic. Yeah. That it's, that it's really, it's not a pleasant or, uh, or delightful experience at all. It's a very unpleasant experience. And yet, and yet the togetherness part of it, there is a, 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 you know, a bonding that occurs particularly in very difficult, stressful situations. Every soldier knows about it. Yeah. Uh, I think people who were in concentration camps, I mean, talk about a miserable condition, mm -hmm. but to go through that with other people creates a bond, which is really quite yeah. glorious, potentially. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'd say it's. You're, I'd say you're you're correct on that. That there is there is a uh, a seed of uh, of um, redemption to that, or or positive aspect to it. But overall, I think it's a very negative experience. But there is there is a certainly there is a togetherness. You know, uh, your your example of the military is a good one. You know, all the guys there feel a certain bondage because are are you know bonding with each other. I should say, because they're going through a miserable experience. And so they do feel a, a certain bond together and, and a lot of close friendships are, are made through that. So I think you're, you're probably right. Yeah, they did eventually. There, there is that aspect of the union. They the, formed uh, the unions, which are still powerful to this day. Um, Eugene, go ahead. Oh yeah, um, but Chris, I think you're right with the uh, ironic, um, sort of uh, meaning of packed sardine tight for non-breakage. I've never heard, yeah. you know, that before, you know, that, yeah. that people are squeezed in together so they don't break. Yeah, no, I think that's ironic. Yeah, I've been on the red clatterers. The, you know, Victoria has the most astonishing railway system probably in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, you'd have to get the red rattlers, sometimes 12 miles and stand all the way to work holding the, the handle and, and all the way back. You were all mushed together. When I was a kid, they would pack our school buses three times the seating capacity. <laughs> and so we, uh, <clears throat> we ruffians made a game out of it. We used to like, uh, uh, clump together and smash somebody you know like against one time one time we Dominic. smashed a guy we actually pushed a window out by smashing a guy against a window. so anyway we invented games to amuse ourselves in the in the uh, difficult circumstances the bad old days <laughs> home to a mansion wide and fair suburban house with grass and air or climb a back street creaking stair to a narrow bed and a lonely chair. 
So yes, he's being ironic, all right. Dinner of but oh, are we done whoa, with that whoa, one? Whoa, 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 whoa! Whoa! Uh, whoa! <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> who then? It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't strike me ironic at all, actually. Um, no, the verse before I was referring to. Home to a mansion wide. Mm -hmm. um, or a I mean, suburban house. To me, it's just, he's just kind of tossing in the, which he's actually done elsewhere here in the book, yeah. sort of the contrasting experiences, depending on which side your karma lands you on. You know, if you're in the, the <clears throat> class that has a nice house in the suburbs versus the one that's packed sardine type, or you could be in both, I guess in today's high-tech society. I think he's also still being a little bit ironic here, uh, overstating what uh, what it is that they're coming home to in those first two lines, because he says, home to a mansion, wide and fair, a suburban house with grass and air. Actually, most of those people that work in factories and uh, commute on the trains and so forth, they're going home to a, it might be in the suburbs, but it's probably, it's. You certainly wouldn't call most of the houses that they're going to a mansion. Yeah. Little. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't know about when Francis wrote this, but certainly in recent years, you got you know the people commuting to and forth to San Francisco, the high tech people, going home to you know two million dollar houses. I mean, they're writing up. Actually, actually, they're probably riding on their Google bus instead of the. the <laughs> yeah, and 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 high tech uh, Silicon Valley engineers uh, in San Francisco. I don't think there's what he's talking about here. He's, he's talking, talking about, about the suburbs. Packed, packed on the bus. Yeah. So, so most most houses would be like the little bungalows in West Asheville, or you know, in any any small community, or or suburb where they're where they're just little little houses in the in the suburbs certainly you would not describe most of those as mansions yeah he's talking about the commission homes and the suburbs and uh returned soldiers entire suburbs and they were little small houses with like know, the factory towns yeah they're, they're like very like that and they were called commission houses commission flats commission areas but they did have the little lawn and the little lawn mower and uh, once you got home for your day and a half off, Sunday and Saturday afternoon, it was perhaps all worth it. It was worth it to be squished in the train and and fitful dreams, and it's, perhaps it was all worth it. And it certainly beats a back street creaking stair with a narrow bed and lonely chair. Definitely. That would be the majority, though. You're right. <laughs> Dinner I mean, I guess the, two, the two characters I see in this um, they're just the ones that come to my mind. One is the sort of the sort of management class who are going home to nice, nice homes, you know, three, four bedroom houses. Some of them have pools, they have nice lawns, yada Ooh. yada. So that's that's the the character in the first two two uh, lines. And then in the second two lines, that one for me is it's kind of the Eleanor Rigby character. It's sort of the elderly um, person who's just sort of the luck of the draw has landed them alone and without without much to sustain them. Um, but well, this person's still a worker though, because he's still coming home in the train. Yeah, if you if you assume there's a tight connection between the previous stanza and this one. I'm not sure that it, it's necessary. I think it refers to both equally, and they're not old. They're still working. Yeah. It seems to me like that, that those two are linked together strongly. Yeah. yeah. You come home to a dinner of bones and bakelite, <laughs> or just a little smoldering spite, while those with fragile appetite prefer eggs fried in gelignite. <laughs> Do you know what, what is gelignite? Do you know what it is? An explosive gel, <laughs> that sets off the other, and it sets off the other explosions. Remember, there's a little bit of gel ignite in the middle of the mine that sets off all the other explosion, explosive things in the mine. 
but gel ignite was a fairly stable explosive gel to set off all the other explosives, isn't it? Gel ignite. Now, how do you know that, Rainy? My that's, father was my father was on true. a <laughs> my father was on a minesweeper for seven years in the navy. There's nothing much I don't know about explosive and explosions. <laughs> well, I better warn Peeler. Yeah, Peeler knows. <laughs> he was warned. <laughs> So, so somebody uh, parsed the first two lines for me. Huh? First two lines. What can you say about that? Oh, dinner of bones and bakelite. So what's, bakel what's bakelite? Bakelite is the substance that was before plastic. You're the geologist here. Bakelite's <laughs> the substance that was before plastic. It's a little bit inflammatory, but it looks like plastic, and it it is a synthesis of amber, right? Holy mackerel. He's the professor here. Things. Come on, you guys. Well, <laughs> no, I what I know about it is that it was a, it was, it was one of the first, what I read described it as a plastic, but it was mm -hmm. one of the first plastics that was made entirely from synthetic materials. Mm -hmm. um, and its chemical composition, it resembles amber, and that's why you cannot really, unless you x-ray amber, know if it's bakelite or amber. So the dinner of bones in Bakelite, we could take as an image of, again, Synthetic. sort of the rowing the hoe with your teeth, just the, the tough yeah. life with little nourishment. Um, but then it's either that or, or spite. So again, this seems to me to be putting a bit of responsibility on the, uh, on the subject there, on the on the whoever the person is, worker, if we insist on always calling them that. I mean, I'm a little wary of making this into too much of a screed against capitalism, because it certainly is that, but that's not the primary focus. The primary focus is a you know is, is a spiritual. A spiritual one and in the spiritual life everybody's got responsibility everybody uh, no, nobody's blameless nobody's the the uh, blameless victim everybody has their own responsibility so i guess i'm seeing this um one of these options of dinner being smoldering spite as being a, 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 a defect to be worked on by the, uh, the subject character in this poem. Yeah, I would agree with that. Although I think overall, certainly the whole tone of this thing is an indictment of capitalism and the focus on the material world driving people crazy, driving them to have a smoldering spite. It's the, the effect that it has on, on people. It, I'm, I'm just a little reluctant to, you know, because I identify with the subject in this poem, with this person who is oppressed by the system, but I'm very reluctant to uh, take on the role of, of victim as if I have no culpability or responsibility in the thing myself. I just, I, I, I think that's a, an injurious uh, position for anybody to take ever. Isn't, isn't the poem doing just that? <laughs> Removing us from being the victim. It's enlightening us in what the victim goes through, identifying the victim and having us analyze um, that we have a lot of this victim in us and we've, we've, we're on we're taffying it out, we're unraveling it, and we've been unraveling it uh, since we fell for it um, and trying to uh, work out a new way. Well, I think the only way it liberates us from that is if we recognize how we've contributed to it. Absolutely, he's saying that. He's saying that all along here. Yes, we've, we've got food on the table, but underneath we've got smoldering spite. And, and even if we've got a fragile appetite, I'll be damned, we still have fried eggs with, with a gelignite, you know, explosive. 
situations going on while the wide and fair mowed lawn is out the front. So on the last two lines, um, first of all, who are the people that have a fragile appetite as opposed to a normal one? And secondly, why are they um, eating something fried in, in a liquid form of explosive? I, I really don't understand that, uh, that line. So the people with a, with a robust appetite <laughs> dine on bo either bones and bakelite or smoldering spite. But the people whose appetite is not so robust have eggs fried in gelignite. Maybe he's referring to people taking on more than they should be taking on for their brains and their mentality and their everything, you know, their, as, as a common phrase in the workers class was that uh, there's nothing worse than somebody really done with a good education. They don't, they don't sense their plight and they go on grabbing it, gelignite. Maybe. Well, he, he can't be talking about Americans because we're 70% obese or something like that. So what we, was the status of obesity in Australia during the 60s? <laughs> Same old fat humans that like to pig out everywhere as far as I can gather in the West. <laughs> I mean, I think it's gotten a lot worse here in the 50 years. Oh, yeah, and Australians were beer drinkers, so they had a lot of fat and they had a lot of yeast, you know. Puffing. So is the level of obesity in Australia sort of comparable to what it is in the US? As far as I could see, as far as I know, I don't see why there's any difference. But you haven't been back in 50 years, have you? I go home twice a year, but I haven't in the oh, last you do. Eight. Oh, mm. and I buy all the local papers. I subscribe to some 40 newspapers I read in the, each week and three of them are in Australia. So I, I sort of half live there. So when you go to the department store in Australia, um, are, are the people like here at Walmarts with massive thighs? And, and, same uh, humans, wherever same? you go. Uh -huh. mm. Yeah, but I mean, Humans, yeah, but there are other countries that don't have the ob obesity, anything like we do. I would say that the four main Western countries that, that we know of that speak English are all, just have as many uh, people with eating disorders and um, overeaters than any other place, Canada, England, America and Australia. Well, that's sort of comforting. I would have thought we were probably the worst. Nah. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> the grass is always greener on the other side. When you get there, it's the same bloody color, you know? All right, push on. Um, duh, it's, uh, duh. But some thrive on boiled cans with beans. Some leather spread with pickled spleens. Others eat only TV screens, depending on their craze and means. Depending on their income. TV dinners would have been big then. Boil cans with beans. Um, if you were in the outback, you boiled the whole can in the water and then opened it. So what is, leather, what is the leather spread with pickled spleens? What's that? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's rubbery bread. Yeah, it seems to me like it's an indictment of the whole uh, awful food that we ate, especially during the 50s and 60s. Uh, yeah. You know, white bread was what everybody ate. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the, it wasn't anything else. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the just no consciousness of uh, good and healthy food, in part because we were being uh, fed this constant diet of advertisements to buy this product and buy that product and yeah. buy this food and that food and, you know, junk food and chips and so forth, constantly advertised. So I think it, to me, he's just talking about that uh, 
that that sort of industrial push towards to eat whatever Big Fist and his con men are are pushing that year. I had a friend when I was a kid who liked um, sandwiches made with uh, mustard and iceberg lettuce on white bread. Yum. <laughs> that was it. Yum. Where's the Vegemite? Yeah, that'll be all right. Thing is, though, he, he was a, quite a good athlete and went on to have an incredibly uh, successful career. He's like the head of a cancer unit at a major hospital or something. So wow. you know, maybe, maybe there was something to it. Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, folks, uh, the, the, um, the top you know, the top 15 or 13 of uh, oh. obese nations are all in the South Seas. Oh. There you go. Well, that's because the Tongans and <laughs> who are, have, have pride in being absolutely huge, all the South Sea Islands are there, you know. They don't want to be thin. It's attractive to be bigger. Wow, that's, I wonder what that is. I know they oh. have those. There was that big ukulele guy that was about five hundred. Israel, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. I heard somebody explain it as um, these were the people, the fat people were the ones who survived these months-long ocean voyages right. to get to these islands. Right. So their genes were the dominant genes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The world is so full of a number of things. Yes. Um, so, uh, let's, so it's uh, 511. So let's read like one more page, read the whole page, and then see if we can knock out four more stanzas. Page 12? Yeah. Someone else can have a go. Yeah. Uh, Chris, why don't you read the page? For those who need an appetite. Appetizer. Mm -hmm. Appetizer. <laughs> You're right, thank you. To those who need an appetizer with taste control and realizer, this recipe is from our first prizer, molasses mixed with fertilizer. <laughs> you missed the evening a, a streets. Stanza. Okay, now, now we shift. The evening streets are spinning wheels. The pavements are gyrating girls. The mayor wearing stiletto heels coyly conducts the dance of seals. Small shopkeepers and laborites swing from the lines of colored lights and bankers from the building's heights hang down in bat like stalactites. Children blowing 10 cent whistles shoot through the crowd like flying missiles and every vantage point bristles with columnists typing their epistles. Folks, we, we, we missed a stanza on the previous page. Oh. No, I don't uh, think so. Some no, on bowl cans with beans, some leather spread with pickles. We did that one, oh, Honey Bunny. Oh, my goodness. I have only TV screens, depending on their craze and means. You must have been digging into the Samoans. Yeah, okay. you, were going, you yeah. were going to South Sea what Island did, chubby people. What did you say about the leather spread with pickled spleen? We had no idea. We just thought it was leathery bread with some sort of relish shoved over it. Well, no, I guess alcoholics get pickled livers, maybe, not spleens, right? Oh, yeah. Right. Well, both, no. maybe. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry. You can look up the average of drunks in the Southern Hemisphere, then the whole world will spin, you know. Uh, Chris, would you read the first three stanzas one more time? Yes, please. The last one's pretty pretty straightforward, but read the first yeah. three. All right. For those who need an appetizer with taste control and realizer, this recipe is from our first prizer, molasses mixed with fertilizer. <laughs> the evening streets are spinning wheels. The pavements are gyrating girls. The mayor, wearing stiletto heels, coyly conducts the dance of seals. Small shopkeepers and laborites swing from the lines of colored lights and bankers from the building's heights hang down in bat-like stalactites. Lovely image of bankers. 
All right, uh, so in the first paragraph, it's pretty straightforward, uh, and it reminds me of sort of some of the, my mother was a, a contester as a hobbyist back in the, when I was a kid. <laughs> she was actually pretty successful at it. They, uh, they had societies where they got together and all the contesters, they studied the judging panels and they knew what the judges' tastes were and so forth. But there were a lot of jingle contests and things like that in those days. And this this reminds me of some of those sort of 50s kind of contests that they had. But yeah. it, the, this appetizer, so taste control and realizer sound like sort of marketing uh, buzz yeah. terms. Yeah. Although realizer is an interesting one. Yeah, I like it. Uh, um, so what do, what do you take it to mean? An influencer, that type, you know, that I, I see it as advertising, you know, nowadays they've got fancy names like influencers, but this is an ad on the telly. But it's a property of the appetizer. Right. So I, I think it's something, an, an additive to the to the food to make it realize its potential. Something oh, like, you, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some kind of fancy salt or a herb, herb or something like that. And then yeah, this, this, yeah. Par this paragraph, I mean, this... Uh, uh, quatrain here obviously refers to the, the previous three or four, which is talking about food right. and our crazy diet. And here we're in the culmination is molasses mixed with fertilizer. Yeah, all the fertilizer on the flour and the wheat. Yeah. Well, well this that stands as prescient of um, of uh, some like wild recipe books that you know uh, have recipes like rubber and powdered plastic you know have you seen those things no no yeah i've seen plastic rice yeah in, in south korea but it's it's meant as as humor you know yeah. it's odd and Randy, i took i took fertilizer as basically a a synonym of shit. So molasses mixed Maybe, with shit. Yeah. But the fertilizer is full of all of that. It's the chemicals. It's the whole thing that wheat turns out to be and growth and, and vegetable. Everything turns out to be that fertilizer that's put on everything, you know. But yes, mostly in those days, it was horse manure. <laughs> or in Japan, night, night, what they call night soil, which is night the, soil. the excrement. At night, they would go out and shit in their field. Soil and green, there it is. Mm -hmm. There's a whole book on it, wasn't there? <laughs> so, Randy, will you, uh, will you read the second stanza? The evening streets are spinning wheels. The pavements are gyrating girls. The mare, wearing stiletto heels, coyly conducts the dance of seals. So this is the hardest one, I think. The, the evening streets are spinning wheels. Uh, could that refer to people uh, drive, driving up and down, uh, yeah. doing what we used to call cruising? Probably. But there's Cars also a, a spinning wheel is what you, you weave cloth on. Right. But uh, oh. the, I think he's referring to the car here. And the pavements are gyrating girls, the girls walking up and down the, the footpath in the city with their- But he says their, the streets uh, are spinning wheels. He doesn't say they have spinning oh. wheels on them. Oh. It went with the rhyme. I, it's, oh. It still sounds to me like he's probably <laughs> talking about cars driving up and down. Yeah. I don't you see can't how walk he, on I don't the street anymore. He's talking it's... about uh, spinning, spinning fabric out of cotton or something. Why say they are spinning wheels? It's poetic. Poetic license. Well, you know, poetic means you use words well. And I sort of take it as a given that Francis does use words pretty well. So I'm not very satisfied with explanations that involve Francis being really sloppy. Well, he's not being sloppy, he's just- sloppy. I think it's just poetic license. Yeah, he's not, he's not being sloppy, but he's just making the, the image that there's no room for us to walk on the road anymore or the horses to walk on the road anymore or anyone else because they're just constantly spinning wheels. 
Yeah. You know, and license may, may have a negative connotation. It's just a poetic way of referring yes. to what he's Clever. talking about. Clever thing, yeah. Well, it certainly could mean those, or it could be intentionally drawing in that meaning uh, along with others. Um, the pavements are gyrating girls. So pavements is the main figure in this whole, this whole poem, this whole section. And now they've become gyrating girls. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with what Franny's, uh, Rainey yeah. said of uh, that, their yeah. girls walking up and down the sidewalk. Waiting to pick up a guy with a car <laughs> because right. they, their family doesn't have one. <laughs> and so they're looking as good as they can and gyrating the hips as they walk. <laughs> well, they might be uh, sex workers. Yeah, they could might be. be. that. could be that. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, but, uh, Eugene, I, I didn't hear what you said. What, did you, what was it? The gyrating girls might be sex workers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the spinning wheels could just be, you know, what we all did as teenagers. We, yeah. we drove up and down the main drag. Yep. Looking for someone, yeah. But the next line's cool. Yeah, so what do we make of the mayor wearing stiletto heels? Well, finally, we've got a female mayor, and she gets around in fancy, you know. Oh, well, you clothes. assumed it was a female. Yeah, why not? We have a, we've had several female prime ministers. Remember, we're not. Well, I know, I know it could be, but I yeah. I didn't assume that it was. I actually assumed oh. that it wasn't. Oh, I assumed it was, it, and yeah. that she was madly conducting the whole city in her stiletto heels. I, yeah, I, I tend to agree with Greg, though. It, it, to me, it makes more sense, given that the context and the nature of the poem, that it's the mayor is uh, effeminate, effeminate, well, perverse. Uh, yeah, there's or, this, or, there's or, this or, thread yeah. of perversion through all of this, right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, that could well be because um, uh, Francis disliked people who dressed fancy. He once said about a person, I won't mention their name, but what is it about people that dress fancy, they look so dirty. So he didn't like people that dressed fancy. How did he feel about cross-dressers? I have no idea. Well, we had a, we had a, a, a person in our community that uh, was trans who was very friendly to her. Yeah, oh, good. Um, Coily conducts the dance of seals. So that sounds like administrative yeah. crossing. All the departments, yeah. So I looked up Dance of Seals because again, he's got it capitalized. So I thought yeah. it's a reference to something, but I couldn't, I couldn't find anything. Huh. So I don't, I don't know what it is exactly. Dance of Seals. I mean, there were, there are the seven seals, right? Which are something from the Bible they were seals on some kind of a holy book that had to be removed one by one in order to reveal the kind of revelation, the darshana uh, that was in the book. And, and I think that was what uh, Bergman's movie uh, made reference to, uh, but, but I, I, I don't know very I, I much about it. I think it's a double entendre of the all of the workers and the community and everybody and all the politicians dancing uh, and and also it refers to the queen seal that he, the mayor is orchestrating all those things at the same time the seal on the document as well as the dancing seals perhaps it's a double entendre coyly conducts pretending Maybe she's shy when she's not a circus act yeah, turning it into a circus act for sure. <laughs> but you're right there that it's both seals. Performing um, seals in the circus and the seals on the document. It's clever. Go ahead, Eugene. Oh, yeah. Quick Google search shows uh, four videos of seals dancing and twerking. Um, <laughs> The twerking seals, Francis. <laughs> Pony Island Aquarium seals dancing around, and did, did and you guys see the uh, did you guys see the twerking uh, shot putter in the Olympics? Yeah, too much. 
don't think I don't think I did. She came in second. From <laughs> In which event? Shot, the shot put or, put. or twerking? <laughs> well, I don't know. Shot put is what, what she was competing. Uh, it could be, it could be uh, dancing seals, but um, that may be stretching it a bit, I think. Yeah, I, I like that sense of the sort of stamp on documents is the one that makes the most sense to me, although I'm not positive there isn't something else in this, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what the reference is. Um, so let's uh, move along because time's running out. Small shopkeepers and laborites swing from the lines of colored light. Oh, laborites, sorry. Small shopkeepers and laborites swing from the lines of colored lights and bankers from the building's heights hang down in bat-like stalactites. All right, so the, the bankers who are like uh, basically vampires, uh, yeah, that's, right. that's easy. Yeah. But mm -hmm. what about, what is the participation in this whole thing of these shopkeepers and laborites, who you would mm -hmm. think are sort of in the group that, if this is a screed against capitalism, they're the group on whose side Francis falls out. Um, think so, yeah. But no, so, so what do we make of their participation in this whole scene here? Mm -hmm. And what and what's the lines of colored lights? The shop yeah. windows allurement. It's allurement, the colored lights. But, but they're, they're, they're all workers, they're all doing their part. And they've all been Drawn into it. Swinging, they're swinging from the lines of these lights, which strikes me as, as they're sort of more or less joyously participating in the in this whole scene. Right. I guess that's it is maybe a reference to the neon lights, the colored lights. But now they're they're. I mean, I don't take this as. It's not a complicity exact. Well, it's a kind of complicity, but they're, it's like they're not that bothered by the whole uh, this whole scene that's taking place. Right. Yep. Good point. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Small shopkeepers are aspiring to be big shopkeepers. Yeah. So they like it. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Somewhere, anyway. But laborites, I mean, what's, is that a laborer? Is there anything different? A laborer, a laborer. But a laborite, I, I, I thought that would refer to somebody who's like a labor organizer, you know, a union, a union man. Maybe. Yes, you couldn't work in retail unless you belong to a union. I belong to several of them, so. Laborite. Uh, Every, everybody's being tricked. Eugene, can you, can you look up laborite if you've got a, yeah, it's um, it's forcing me to look at look uh, Labradorite, and that's no, not no. it. Yeah. That's what I tried to say. But look up L A B O U R. Oh, because okay. He's translated it to the American spelling, but it might have an a, a Commonwealth meaning, in uh, in mm, with the. Um, Labradorite. Labradorite has a different. Completely Labradorite different. is uh, quite valuable. Oh, it's it's a and member you. or supporter of a labor party. There yeah. you go. You hit it. Oh. Yep. Labor. Member labor or supporter. Yeah. So is, was, <clears throat> was the labor party actually labor on the side of the laborers or were they exploiting them or yes, both? That, well, they, they were the left. Yeah. Yeah. But our right is, is the, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, our right party is called the liberals and we were the labor. So the majority were the Labour. This was what's interesting about the Liberals running everything all the time is the majority are Labour. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's still curious to me that the shopkeepers and Labourites, as with our now understanding, are, are participating in this. I, I don't know what that means exactly. but Well, yes, they're participating in it, but they're demanding that you only work five days and that you get five weeks annual leave with full pay and so well, you're I sure, paid I sure don't get food. that from this stanza that may be yeah but he's not he's not saying that they really are no he's uh, saying they're with big, big 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 fist in the speakman uh, but he is he does imply that they're not uh resisting what's going on yeah. 
Yeah, right. they're part of it too. All right, last one. Children blowing 10 cent whistles shoot through the crowd like flying missiles and every vantage point bristles with columnists typing their epistles. So it sounds what? like the first two lines is just, he's just talking about kids' behavior. Uh, I don't think he's really in saying anything particularly negative about no, children kids. blowing 10 cent whistles. It's just what yeah. kids do. They shoot through the crowd like flying missiles. Right. It's great, <laughs> colorful language. It's Yeah, it's a I, great little one. It's so good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the journalists are typing in. This is going great. Did you see, you know, the diamond store sold more diamonds last week and the little man with the handkerchief shop, he sold more hankies and everybody's into it. It's on. This is happening. Yeah, and the every vantage point bristles with columnists typing their epistles. So every every columnist has their own vantage point. They're conservative or they're liberal or they're this or that, and they and they're typing their epistles for the weekly for the daily newspaper, typing their columns. Yeah, and I get the sense that Francis thinks it's uh, a lot of, you know, it's way overdone. It's it's a lot more commentary than is really of any use to anybody. That it's just sort of jabber. It's a bit of jabber, yeah. Given that uh, you know the reality is God and 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 love, and and that's not what the columnists are talking about. Right, and as Chris pointed out, you know aspects of this were written and submitted to papers and for publication in in the fifties, and this this would have been a fairly radical statement when this was this was what was happening. You know, we're going to get out of the Second World War, and we're going to we're going to get a little commission house for five pounds a week. I'm um, out in the dark, dark suburbs, even if we have to ride for an hour and a half on a squish train and it's, things are still looking up, you know. <laughs> yep. Yep. Where, mm -hmm. where, uh, it was pretty extreme, a statement at the time from a poet because poets and writers were usually from better off families. 